So Ken, do you think we will see something like 50% renewables or more in the electricity system in 2030? I think uh, we might even get there before then. Uh, you know, the latest data from the Clean Energy Regulator shows that we're on course for reaching that number if nothing intervenes uh, by around the middle of the 2020s. Uh, of course, a lot of things could intervene, uh, but uh, by and large, uh, our industry has shown the capacity to deliver uh, the world's highest rate of renewables per capita uh, and we're uh, just going gangbusters in that area. Yes, we've seen a massive improvement in the economics of renewables mm. and the competition is really on now between wind and solar and uh, existing coal, let alone any new coal-fired power stations that would just simply not be competitive. But nevertheless, there's issues because uh, the more renewables we have, the more we need to invest in transmission and also in storage. That's right. Um, and so uh, that's, the, that's the areas, to my uh, analysis, that we'll need uh, looking after from a policy and regulatory uh, sense uh, in the 2020s. Indeed. And, and I think, you know, this is the key issue that uh, Australia does need uh, a policy that aligns energy and climate targets, uh, particularly electricity uh, sector reform and, uh, you know, transmission and storage are a key element of that. But I think also having a policy certainty around environmental issues is also very important. And of course, the big word that no one dares utter in the political sphere in Australia these days is a price on carbon. And so that would make for an economically effective and cost effective outcome. But of course, there's other ways that you can achieve a relatively similar outcome um, with different policy approaches that could apply in individual sectors. And I guess we see both major parties moving in, in that direction, perhaps at differing speed. Um, but, but clearly that, that is the, uh, the direction that, uh, that things are moving in. I agreed. And I think, you know, the world is moving that way as well. So Australia, you know, is in an international context when it comes to trade. Uh, if our major trading partners are moving in the direction of carbon pricing, whether it be in a particular sector or across the board, uh, then Australian export industries will obviously have to conform with that. And that will then feed back into the domestic circumstances as well. So I think you're right, eventually that will happen. Um, either side of politics will have to address that. And that will mean that in Australia eventually we'll have a carbon pricing system of some sort or another in the future. And one of the topics that are of extreme interest in our conversations, in particular with state governments, uh, but also federal governments and local communities, is the transition that we will see in the energy system, right? So we, we have a very clear picture of how in the long term we will see coal replaced by renewables plus storage. But of course, that means uh, less employment in particular regional localities where these coal plants are, where the coal mines are and new opportunities springing up, but not necessarily in the same place. And so we've seen that happen in the Latrobe Valley. We'll see it happen again uh, in Victoria, in New South Wales, and further down the track, probably in Queensland as well. So uh, to our mind, this is an important area for future governments to look into, and not just to look into, but to help proactively um, in making that transition happen. Uh, and in helping create predictability around that, so that the next batch of closures of large coal-fired power stations don't just happen with very little notice, but uh, so that they can happen on an anticipated time scale with time to prepare for the local communities, time for companies to put in place safety mechanisms, uh, social safety nets, uh, and also for that replacement investment to be there um, at a good time scale. That's right, agreed. And you know, this massive transformation that's going to happen in our economy and our energy sector in particular over the coming decades needs to ensure that nobody gets left behind, particularly the people, as you mentioned, that are in industries that are going to transition into new industries, but also from the consumer perspective, the consumers aren't left behind as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's great to have uh, the world's highest level of solar PV penetration on rooftops of 20% in the world. Uh, but we want to make sure that everyone can benefit from that and people on low income should be a participant in this transition process as well as people on higher income. So I think the transition social equity issues are very, very important and both sides of politics have to look into that. However, I would say that uh, on the renewable side of things, uh, that uh, because of this uh, capability the Australian industry has demonstrated and the very rapid rollout of renewables, that we could find uh, you know, unexpected uh, closures of coal-fired power stations just simply because 
economics is driving this without a plan beforehand. So there is a clear need for governments to be involved in brokering these discussions uh, because without it we could just find that the sheer economics of renewables is closing plants much earlier than uh, anticipated and this could provide significant dislocation issues. It could very well do so and what we've seen in unanticipated closures is price spikes uh, for electricity because the replacement investment isn't there on time. And so consumer prices I think are very rightly in the headlines um, and of course part of that equation is the gas price which has risen a lot. So Ken, how do you see the future of gas in Australia's energy mix? Well that's another interesting question because uh, you know gas uh, quite clearly uh, is regarded as a transition fuel by many people, uh, that you could uh, replace coal with gas uh, at the uh, generator level uh, and this would reduce our emissions uh, by roughly half in terms of the amount of electricity being produced. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you have to look at the price side of things as well. And this is where coupling to the international price on gas is an issue because the domestic price uh, will follow that. And uh, the other thing that's coming up, of course, is the potential for gas to be replaced by hydrogen. That's a very long-term prospect. It again might be driven by external factors like uh, Japan and Korea mandating a hydrogen economy by a particular point in time and Australia being a major provider. So we might simply provide them with the hydrogen they need, potentially generated by renewables through electrolysis from water. Uh, and this would create a, an international price and if we wanted to do the same thing in Australia to replace gas then we'd be price takers in that market as well. So again, very interesting questions following on from our experience and lessons in the LNG industry. And there we're getting to a very exciting topic that I think all major parties in Australia would actually be behind and that is Australia as an energy superpower in a low carbon world. Indeed. So we have all the natural prerequisites for this. The wind blows, the sun shines, we have the ports, we have the land, we have the experience in energy markets and as an energy exporter. And uh, increasingly this is something that people come to realise this is no longer just uh, in the universities uh, of, of this country, but increasingly that's a, that's a topic for governments and business. Australia is a massive producer of hydrogen exactly. and higher order synthetic fuels based on renewables. And the other thing to think about too is uh, prospects for directly exporting electricity through undersea cables to Indonesia and beyond. And indeed this is part of our ANU Grand Challenge to uh, look into these prospects for exporting electricity, exporting hydrogen, exporting value-added renewable energy embedded in other products like uh, refined metals. So there are huge opportunities to transform the way Australia trades with the world based on renewable energy. And we could simply shift from a largely fossil fuel based trading system, coal and gas, uh, as well as uh, carbon uh, intensive uh, export of, uh, of uh, iron ore, which eventually uses uh, carbon to uh, uh, create steel and we could transform that completely into an export industry based on renewables and uh, that transition uh, will inevitably happen over the next uh, decades as, uh, as fossil fuels become less and less uh, a part of the energy mix worldwide uh, and I think we, we have huge opportunities that we can grasp in this space as well. And the research that uh, we and others have done shows quite clearly that 100% renewables or close to 100% renewables in Australia is possible. But there's actually no need to stop there. It could be 200% renewables with the other 100% for export Indeed. through the region. We can be the exporter, the, the, the region supplier of renewable energy. Indeed, and why not 500% renewables if we use it to uh, turn iron ore into steel and, uh, and other products? So yes, absolutely. And if we can arrange that in a way so that Australia actually reaps a lot of the economic benefits from this as well. So big challenges for future governments in that as well. That's right, and you could see in the long-term future that Australia is moving into a position uh, where we can uh, value add to all these uh, wonderful resources that we have in this country in a way that we've never done before and potentially we could set ourselves up with a sovereign wealth fund that could see our future generations uh, not having to worry about infrastructure and many of the other aspects of investment in our society based on renewable energy. And Ken, where is nuclear in all of this? So I think probably the window for nuclear is uh, rapidly closing or is maybe closed already. Uh, there it requires at least a mandate from the population to make this happen. This might take five years. 
Uh, it would take maybe five years uh, to uh, set up a regulatory framework as well. And then if you're going to build a nuclear power station, to, you know, on the basis that we're going to go ahead with this, it would take another five years after that. So we're talking sometime in the 2030s before we'd ever see something happening. And by then, the cost of renewables plus storage uh, might be so much cheaper that uh, it simply would price nuclear out of the market. So I think that uh, probably the window is, is closed or, or almost closed. Uh, but there is the prospect of one uh, opportunity arising, perhaps even in remote areas, which is the use of small modular reactors. And these are at the scale of um, 100 megawatts or several hundred megawatts, uh, which are self-contained. Uh, they can be used, I don't know, to power a mining operation out in the middle of the desert. Uh, and you can add to those one by one by one just to uh, increase the capacity. So there may be an opportunity there, but it needs the social license for us to do that. I think even more importantly is the role that we might play in the international nuclear fuel cycle, not only as one of the world's largest uh, uranium producers and the largest repository of uranium in the world, but also potentially to store other people's nuclear waste in the future. And this was raised, for example, in the South Australian Royal Commission into the nuclear fuel cycle. So we might be a participant in that. We're a very stable country, geologically, politically, economically, and this might have great attractions in that uh, sphere for other countries to make us the good citizen of the world in storing nuclear waste in an environment which it'll remain in for, for a long time. Frank, I mean, you know, we've discussed this before, uh, that we've been in a policy-free environment now for more than a decade in terms of energy aligning well, with climate. Policy-confused Or maybe policy-confused environment, indeed. Uh, <laughs> so uh, is this election uh, an opportunity for that to change? Could it be a tipping point, at which point we might end up with a, a, an alignment of energy and climate policy that will see us into the future? What, what are your thoughts there? Oh, my. I mean, industry and investors are just crying out for that, for some not even policy certainty, but policy predictability and stability. And there is a chance, yes, um, but what that requires is for climate change policy and energy policy to disappear from the front pages of the newspapers. And once that happens, um, some better work can be done. There's different scenarios for how that could happen, for how we could see uh, the politics being taken out of these issues, or at least put in the background uh, and, and the policy and economics of this being put in the foreground and let's hope that might happen after this election. Indeed and uh, you know it'll be up to the uh, voters in the long run and, uh, and they have the choice uh, now I guess and if they look at the opposition and they look at uh, the government and they look at all the other parties they might see that there are differences there and I think the interesting thing and the unique thing about this election at least at the moment is that uh, here we have uh, one uh, side of politics uh, talking about policies to align energy and climate and the other side with no policy. And so I think it's a very unusual circumstance to find ourselves in this close to the election. Maybe it'll come out in a few weeks. Uh, but as an academic, uh, most academics are unwilling to make a call on you know, whether you should vote for one party or another. But when one party has a policy and one doesn't, I think there's a very clear choice for the electorate.